Hi, this is Kevin from Leeds. Today on Leeds Helpful Tips, we're going to discuss interference figures and how do we see them or how do we perform conoscopic imaging. The uh, normal use you have for a compound microscope, we set up kohler illumination and we perform what's called orthoscopic imaging. Um, we're all pretty familiar with that. We focus down on a sample, we focus our condenser properly, and we look at the sample underneath the microscope. Um, in conoscopic imaging, what we're actually trying to do is gather some insight about the crystal structure of the mineral, the chemical, um, in some cases even a fiber, and try to uh, get more quantitative information to help us identify this crystal. Um, typically when we're looking at crystals, at least in rock, which is where my experience is, sometimes we're going to get uh, uh, samples that from the orthoscopic imaging, again, what we would normally see focusing on the sample and in cross-polarized light, um, we can't tell the difference. Uh, we have two or three suspected minerals. They all perform or have about the same amount of birefringence. Therefore, their colors look the same. What we want to do is see if we can get some insight into the crystal structure. And when we do that, it should help us identify uh, the sample that we're looking at. At least in my experience with my geology degree, we had a whole semester on polarized light probably several weeks worth of uh, uh, classes on interference figures. What I'm going to try to show you today is how do we see an interference figure? And number two, I'm going to tell you that if you are going to try to use interference figures to identify crystals, you're going to want to get yourself a handbook. I apologize, I made a special trip today and got my uh, Dear Howie and Zeusman. It's a manual that I used when I was in geology um, where it will take me through a whole series of uh, steps to try to determine what a crystal is and then it'll give me information on the interference figures. Um, it's something that's done, at least in my mind, totally with a reference book. It's not something where you can look at that crystal and go, oh, it's biclinic and it's negative, so therefore it's olivine. Well, no, but I've got a book and using that book I can walk through a, uh, a tree and narrow down the uh, uh, characteristics of the sample that will help me lead to identify it. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at what are called conjugate planes in a Kohler illuminated microscope. So I've pulled up an optical diagram for you here. And what we're going to talk about first are conjugate field planes. All we're talking about when we use the word conjugate is that these planes are optically superimposed on themselves. So everything that's in the conjugate field plane can be viewed at the same time because the optical planes are superimposed over one another. So if we start down here, I don't know how well you can see this diagram, but this is supposed to be my light bulb that's beginning my illumination ray path here. And we've passed through a lens, and the first thing that we see is that there's a conjugate field plane here, which is located at the aptly named field diaphragm. This is the diaphragm that we should be opening and closing to control the amount of light, the area of light coming to our sample. And when our Kohler microscope is pro or Kohler illumination is properly set up, we've actually used the condenser to focus the image of this diaphragm onto the sample. The sample, if we move up our tree, is one of those conjugate field planes. So what that's saying is the field diaphragm and the sample are in focus at the same time. Something that I guess we uh, more or less knew. Um, if we stop and think about it. Then they're referring to an intermediate image plane here right before this lens. And what that's referring to is there is a field image that forms in your eyepiece. Um, modern microscopes uh, 
have this field, the image formed 10 millimeters inside of this uh, eyepiece tube. And if we were able to look at 10 millimeters inside this microscope, we would actually find a hard edged circle that is slightly smaller in diameter than the overall eye tube. That is what, or the overall eyepiece tube, that is what is actually forming the hard edge around the image that you see when you look through the microscope. Um, the human eye likes that hard edge there. Um, if you don't have a, a, a diaphragm or a restrictive diaphragm at this point, what's gonna happen is the image will just sort of blur off to the edges and most people find that distracted. Um, incidentally, you could measure the diameter of that uh, reduced diaphragm, if you will, and it would correspond to the field of view of the eyepieces. In this case, we have a 23 millimeter field of view, the largest of any comparison microscope out there, and we could actually go in and measure that diaphragm and find it to be 23 millimeters in diameter. And then the final uh, field plane, conjugate plane, if you will, is in the back of your eye, in the retina of your eye, which again, if we think about, that makes sense. I see the sample in focus in my eye. I see a nice sharp edge around my image when I'm looking through the eyepiece. Um, I see the sample in focus, assuming we've properly focused the, the objective. And then <clears throat> finally, I'll see that field diaphragm in focus. Um, typically, you won't see it because we've opened it outside its field of view, but if you were to close it down, you would see that, that diaphragm, okay? We've also got a series of aperture planes that are conjugate, and that's what's over to the right of my diagram here. Um, the first one is formed at the uh, illumination, if you will. There is a uh, picture of a light filament here. Um, more than likely today, it's gonna be an LED bulb, um, but at any rate, um, in color illumination, we're gonna see and talk about in a minute that, that that image is supposed to be homogeneous and located in the rear focal plane of the objective, okay? So um, in many cases today, if we take a look at it, what we're gonna see is a ground glass. Um, that's what's gonna make that filament image uh, homogeneous, if you will. Um, what's important isn't whether it's a filament or not, it's important that it's in focus in the rear focal plane of the objective. And the reason that we want to fill it fully is so that um, we're getting all of the information we can out of that objective. So we've got a aperture plane that exists at the image of the uh, light source. We've got another one that is located in the condenser itself. And that's where, again, aptly named, we have our aperture diaphragm. Our aperture diaphragm is what we use to control the contrast and depth versus the resolution of the image that we're seeing. Um, and then finally, um, I'm sorry, I skipped one, let's back up. Then we have the rear focal plane of the objective, which I've already talked about a little bit. This is actually the image plane where that optical interference figure is viewed. And then finally, there is an aperture plane at your eyeball. Um, most people don't realize this, but your eye is a lens and it is being used as part of the complete optical system here. So that real image that we talked about for a field plane forms in the retina. An intermediate image is formed in the iris or at the front of your eye, if you will. And then your eye focuses it to that field plane in the back. Okay, so what happens in conoscopic imaging is that we want to view not the field planes, but we want to view the aperture planes. And the reason we want to view them is that when we look at a crystalline material in polarized light, when light enters that crystal, it's split into at least two orthogonal planes and the light's going to travel at different speeds along the two axes of those orthogonal waves, if you will. What ends up happening then is they become out of phase with one another, 
and those rays recombine in the rear focal plane of the objective and interfere with constructive and destructive uh, 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 interference to form this optical interference figure. Um, it's a lot to absorb, but if we think about it, it's really a pretty simple thing to achieve or look at an optical interference figure. One of the things I can do is remove the optics that are coming from the eyepiece, and then I've got a straight shot at the rear focal plane of my objective. The problem with that is, and, and you may have enough information to be able to see what you want to see there, but the problem with it is, is it's a very small image. Um, we want to use a very high numerical aperture, high magnification objective when we do this, typically a 40x objective, and you will see a significant improvement between a 40.75 and a 40.95 numerical aperture objective. The higher the numerical aperture of the objective, the more rays that we're going to, orders of interference that we're going to pull into that image by bringing those extra light wave rays in, and that's going to lead to a crisper optical interference figure. But to go back to it, technically all I need to do is pull out that eyepiece. But that high NA objective's really got a small lens in the rear focal plane, and we're not going to see a very large image. It might only occupy 10 or 20% of the image. So what we want to do, or ideally would like to do, would be to magnify that image so that we're able to see it with more detail by making it larger. And um, we're able to do that by inserting something called a Bertrand lens into the system, okay? For any of those out there that are familiar with phase microscopy, in phase microscopy, when we're aligning the phase diaphragms in the condenser and the objective, you could use a phase telescope. It's optically very similar to a Bertrand lens. It doesn't tend to have a hard diaphragm on it, and just like we wanted a hard edge diaphragm for contrast in our eyepiece, it's helpful to have one in an interference figure. The other thing is, is that a phase telescope or pulling out the eyepiece only lets you see that image to your eye. It doesn't allow you to bring that image forward uh, to the photographic or the uh, digital capture system you have on your microscope. So um, what do we need to do to achieve an optical interference figure with a Bertrand lens? Let's stop for a minute and talk about it. A Bertrand lens is simply a lens that's been designed to project the image of the rear focal plane of the objective. It's got a hard stop on it to give me some nice sharp contrast. And because it nearly fills the field of view of my 10x eyepiece, I'm able to see it with far greater detail than just looking down the eyepiece tube, if you will. So what do we need to do to achieve an optical interference figure? We set up our microscope for color illumination. We put in our cross polars, so I'm now living in polarized light, looking in polarized light, if you will. And then what we're going to do is insert, I'm sorry, and we're going to get that crystal in nice sharp focus. This is one of the reasons that you have a centering stage and or centering uh, objectives is because while we are observing or trying to see the interference figure from this crystal, we need it to maintain its position underneath the objective uh, itself. So we're centering it so that when I rotate the stage to help me look at this interference figure and how these waves are interfering with one another, I'm going to stay on the crystal. I'm not going to rotate, the crystal's not going to rotate in and out of my uh, area of field of view. Okay? So, Kohler illumination, cross polars. I talked a little bit about numerical aperture. So as with any high dry magnification, we're going to want to have um, the top lens of the condenser inserted. So again, just regular Kohler illumination, if you will. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to bring the Bertrand lens in. Okay, so let me back up and I'm going to switch screens here for you for a little bit. So now we're switched to a live camera. I've got this great big olivine crystal in focus underneath my 40x objective, my pole objective with a 40.990 numerical aperture. We're in cross poles, and I'm going to insert the Bertrand lens now. So this is the crystal that you're seeing on your screen. I know it's just green, and you can see that the crystal tries to go extinct on me but I've got an automatic gain going on my camera, so the camera keeps trying to pull the light up. Um, but like most crystalline materials, when it's rotated under polarized light, it produces a distinctive color. That color is assumed on that crystal being 30 microns thick, which is how thick we prepare a geology slide. Okay. And then what I need to do is insert the Bertrand lens. Sometimes the Bertrand lens is a intermediate piece between the binocular of the microscope and the uh, uh, top reflected light portion of the microscope. Um, it is, um, in other times, in this case, placed in the turret, um, filter turret above your objectives. Okay? Um, I really like this one because there's not a whole lot you need to do, and you can actually rotate it in while you're sitting in front of the microscope. You can see my microscope isn't perfectly clean here. Probably that stuff is on the back of the objective. But this is an optical interference figure that we're seeing on this olivine crystal. And as I slowly rotate this, what you're going to see, and they don't show up quite as sharp as I was hoping for, we lose a little bit on the camera, but these black lines that you see are called isogyres, okay? By looking at those isogyres, we can start to interpret the crystal structure. This one's actually got two isogyres that come to form... Sorry, the camera's just a little slower than my eyes... that come to form this classic Maltese cross. Okay. Now, you can get that Maltese cross in a monoclinic crystal, but you will never see two arms that come together to create that isogyre. That's why I said you really got to get a book and you got to follow through what these, iso, what these uh, interference figures are and how they form and then have a book that's going to allow you to uh, go through a series of steps, take some measurements, and start to determine what the crystalline material you have. Um, the colors that you see in these corners of the isogyre are also very important, and they have to do with allowing us to determine whether something's, uh, in this case, biaxial. Is it biaxial negative or is it biaxial positive? And what we're uh, trying to do is determine within that crystal is the primary axis the fast axis of light speed. Remember, we talked about a sample uh, uh, in polarized light, a crystal sample uh, spreads the earth, takes a single beam of light and breaks it into two orthogonal beams. Um, so at any rate, we can look at which one of those orthogonal vectors is in the primary crystal structure. It's a lot to take in. I could spend days talking about optical interference figures. What I wanted to give you an understanding is what you were looking at. And then we're just going to do a couple little things here, and then we'll finish up. So if I am correct in how I taught you all of this, as I close down the aperture diaphragm, you see the, the aperture diaphragm, okay? Why do I see that? Because if I go back to my picture, the conjugate planes that we have here are, there is one in the uh, uh, condenser located at the aperture plane, which is why I see it, okay? And you can see how important it is going to be to have that one all the way open. So again, the aperture plane is in focus. 
the rear focal plane of the objective is in focus, and um, we aren't seeing the one that would normally form at the front of our eye because we've created and put in a different optical system to allow us to see that. Okay? Um, hope that takes through you takes you through how you get an optical interference figure. If someone really wants to talk about them, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to have a discussion with you. And I hope that wasn't too much to try to cram into a 15, 20 minute video. Um, the final thing I thought I'd do just for uh, your enjoyment, I was pla practicing save microscopy. It had its masks on. Um, I'm going to switch over to the other side here and take you back to a live camera image. And here's a biotitic nice. What does that mean? We'll make it simple. Nice is like a granite, a uh, igneous material. It was formed out of hot molten lava or hot molten rock, I should say. Biotite is a crystal like mica. If any of you ever played with mica books, um, mica is a almost transparent mineral that forms in flat sheets and typically in what they would call a tabular uh, formation. So we have these very thin sheets and they're stacked on top of one another and you can almost peel them apart like the pages of a book. So if anybody says you can't see through rock, you can tell them that you looked at rock that was 30 microns thick on a microscope and we sent light through it. So thank you. I hope that was helpful. Please, any questions you got, feel free to reach out to me on your own. Thank you.